Hello, everyone. Hey, welcome to the most recent presentation of the Metal Architecture webinar series. I'm Paul Deppenball with Metal Architecture. And today we're going to be talking about the powder and liquid FEVE coatings for curtain wall and other architectural applications. Uh, it's a mouthful. It's being presented today by Lumiflon. Bill Haggerty's here to be our presenter today, and I'm going to give him the reins in just a moment. But uh, let's take care of a couple of the questions that I know you're going to have. Uh, the first one is, for those who are interested in getting AIA credits or need certificates, all of that's going to be handled automatically. You don't need to do anything. Uh, it'll be taken care of, but just allow us seven business days to take care of it. After that, follow up with me. Tomorrow, uh, 24 hours after the end of this webinar, you're gonna receive an email that'll have some of that information. It's gonna have a link to a recording of the email and some other stuff. Uh, so uh, look for that. The second item I wanna to touch base with, and this is an important one, and that's how do you ask questions during the webinar? Uh, Phil's a great resource and you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of that. So we're gonna handle questions at the end of a couple of times during the webinar, uh, in ends of each section, and then at the end of the webinar. Um, post your questions on the panel there, uh, don't be shy. Um, I'll review them and bring them up with uh, Phil during those periods when we're answering questions. Uh, but uh, now let's get to the good stuff. Uh, let me introduce uh, Philip Haggerty. He's currently the technical sales manager of AGC Chemicals Americas for the Lumiflon FEBE product line. He has broad experience in the chemical industry across various polymer technologies and job functions. And while Phil has been in the coatings industry for a little more than two years, his experience working with manufacturers and end users in the materials extends over eight years solving customer challenges from manufacturing to material selection. Uh, as a technical sales manager, Phil leads the team to support customers' Lumiflon chemistry and business challenges. He received an MS in chemical engineering from the University of Dayton in 2016, and he and I just spent quite a bit of time talking about his soccer career, uh, so you might want to ask about that also. All right, Phil, the room is yours. Take it over. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for introducing me. I'll start off with a, a paint pun, if anyone's there, and then also just recognize the day. So I'm going to blend the rules a little bit and wish everyone uh, may the fourth be with you. So we'll jump right in to, to it for powder and liquid FEV coatings and curtain wall and other architectural applications. So there's the course number as well as the, the credit that you get for the CE hour. So just to recognize this is AIA certified. If you go through Paul, as he had mentioned, you get the accreditation. If not, um, you can, we, as long as you're registered, you'll automatically get it. And for the CES credits, I think that's where you have to email info um, at lumaflon.com. Um, so this is a structured web-based format with a final exam. So it's one credit and then it would be about an hour so 50 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions at the end for more extended and as paul said the the breaks in between i love questions questions are interactive they help break it up and then and so you when you see something you can then and talk through it so i'll jump right into the course description so in this course we'll discover the strengths and advantages of feve fluoropolymers top coats for when for windows, curtain walls, architectural elements, and places really where you have, you don't want to re-maintenance and you don't want to be fixing it up all the time. You want it to set it and, and forget about it. You want it to last for a long time. We will evaluate the lifetime effects of weathering on different coatings from some of the, the testing that's available within the materials world and review what that accelerated and real-time weathering data looks like in different environments. Uh, we will also assess some of the life cycle cost advantages from a cost standpoint as well as a material usage standpoint from the initial cost compared to other top coat formulations that exist out there that you might be accustomed to if you've been specifying paint. From this course, you will be able to discuss the differences between conventional and high performance FVVE coatings as well as considerations when selecting a coating system uh, and some of the characteristics that you get from an FEVE system that you might not have been aware of in the past um, and can learn about today. You'll be able to discuss some of the real-time weathering, and this is data that comes from uh, the resources we have in our labs, which we have a full technical center to test these things out, 
And then you'll be able to quantify some of the cost and environmental considerations when looking at FEV coatings versus other ones for lead accreditation and some of the, the new specifications that might come up to date. And then view some of the real world applications that people have selected FEVE that I'm sure you'll recognize one or two buildings uh, within some of the photos we present today. Uh, so just jumping into it, I'm sure everyone recognizes the famous uh, hotel in Singapore. Uh, and this was selected for a, a powder coating on Lumipon to jump right into, into it. So the reason you use high performance coatings is you're gonna wanna last against weathering and corrosion. And the way you get that is by maintaining aesthetics as well as through integrity. And this is gonna lead to applications like uh, large and tall buildings, which are tough to reach, tough to maintain, your infrastructure projects like bridges uh, that are crucial for operation and cost efficiency that you can't have them come down. And, and you just want the coatings to last longer, maintain their gloss, maintain their color. It, it's really a high performance industry where the value and having something that will withstand corrosion and deterioration from weather impacts is you, you're going to extract that each year over each year as time goes on. Highly durable coatings maintain their aesthetic and are essential for keeping a structure looking good and longer for uh, and to last a long time. So some of the considerations that you'll get when you're selecting a coating, uh, which every application has its fit for what material you wanna go into, but some of the selections that you'll look for uh, high performance coatings is you want that, make sure that finish lasts for a long time. Um, you want that luster and that gloss or that specific finish for a logo or business like you want it to pop you want it to show you want to show like the way that buildings look to be able to maintain their strength their weatherability their durability their corrosion you don't want it to change you want people to recognize it and have that same look throughout the lifetime of the structure fluoropolymer resins are commonly used for their superior performance these coatings are known for their durability and ability to maintain that initial performance over extended long periods. Did I jump to? All right. Uh, the conventional coating systems, which you might be used to, is a three part coating system. So it's your initial zinc rich primer, your epoxy mid coat, and the polyurethane top, top coat. Those have good corrosion protection uh, and that gloss retention and that color retention will stay for five to 10 years. And you'll notice that that's, that's pretty common within the US, polyurethanes are used for a lot of applications. Um, but with a fluoropolymer coating, it's gonna be the same type of system. You're still gonna have that zinc rich primer, you're gonna have that epoxy mid coat, and then you're gonna have a thermoset fluoropolymer top coat. And that's the, the part that's gonna change. And that top coat uh, is what's going to give it the protection from the UV resistance. And that's really all you're changing within the system. Uh, you can change some of the other aspects in these specific formulations. The paint manufacturers will help you work through that. But the, the only thing that's changing is just that top coat layer to be able to give you this extra protection. So what are the two most common used fluoropolymers? They're PVDF and FEVE. So these are the two most common ones. And uh, PVDF has been used for a long time. I believe it was invented in the US um, and they've been used. The, the disadvantage that they have is that they have to be applied at a high temperature just due to the inherent material characteristic that it is, it's, it's thermoplastic. So that limits all the field application, that limits maintenance work, that limits uh, the gloss range and pigment compatibility that can be used with PVDF. So really, uh, when it was invented, uh, the reason why FEV was invented was uh, it, it came out of Japan and they wanted to maintain their structures in the field because they're a bunch of island connections versus where we are in the U.S. And so those, they didn't want to have to go out and repaint the bridges. So they needed something that could be field applied. So they formulated the FEVE to be able to be used for on-site applications but also since it did have that UV character is like the UV um, potential to, to prevent like degradation and corrosion, it could also be used in field applied, but also factory. It, just because it can be used in the field doesn't mean it can't be factory applied as well. And with just the inherent characteristic of the material it is, it has excellent pigment compatibility. It can be used for a wide color range, uh, wide gloss range, exposure two to three times longer than the conventional polyurethane. 
um, and they're soluble in pretty much any conventional soluble solvent. And so it can be used with standard paint equipment and it has some lifetimes of up to, to 60 years, depending on where you are in, in terms of UV exposure and within the UV index on the globe. Jumping into the chemistry, uh, if you want to dig up the high school chemistry books, so it, it, the reason how it got invented is it's a two-part system. It's a fluoroethylene and a vinyl ether. The fluoroethylene is where you get the weather, or the durability, the chemical resistance. And nothing's going to beat that carbon fluorine bond. If you dig up back to, to wavelength, the energy of sunlight does not break down that carbon fluorine. So that's what you get that durability and the ability to resist last a long time, not to corrode, not to break down. But then the vinyl ether is really what gives you, as an architect, what you're really looking for. And that's that gloss, that solubility, that cross-linking finish where you get that hard, hardness. Um, and so that's where you can start to use it for a wider range of color selection, application selection that you might not have had with the conventional PVDF uh, fluoropolymer systems. So that's where the FEV is, is unique and has a lot of advantages to work with. Um, and then you can see the chemical structure there. Uh, so those characteristics um, is that just, it's through that carbon fluorine bond to, to, to bring that home. So that's that gloss color tension long period of time. That alternating structure, is where it, it helps play with all those. And once again, FEVE can be used in shop or field applied for construction or even uh, with with touch up paint, and you do not need heat to have these uh, be applied. You don't need heat to apply an FEV system. Uh, they can use a standard painting uh, equipment, and they have many advantages uh, as far as scratch and uh, mar resistance as well. And also, just like the PVDF systems, the FEVE also withstand the on the twenty six oh five standards. Uh, there's and there's other options like as in the powder coatings where you could do a coil in, in the factory um, or you can use it as a touch up paint and with any standard painting equipment as well. So that makes this an ideal coating for if you're looking at curtain wall, facades, bridges, it's really those places where you don't wanna be repainting. You want it to last for a long time and you really want those that, that building to pop and to show your designs that you're coming through with of why they're unique, why they're special, to drive it, draw the attention and keep that attention there from a, uh, a human perspective. Uh, so what are the aesthetics of FEVE? Its uh, color palette is wide. Typically, you can go from white, black, green, ivory, sandstone, bronze, metallic. I mean, you pick the color. It's, it's available in a wide range of colors and glosses. It, it's, just comes down to what what do you want to see out of it. it it's got some unique perspectives of what you can see and, and you'll recognize from some of these buildings if you've seen them in real life just how wide the range of, of selection that you can get from it. Uh, it's got excellent pigment compatibility. Uh, it's solvent uh, soluble in water and compatible in uh, other polymers as well for brighter more vivid colors and we offer a broad range of gloss from satin to flat to high gloss as well. So you're not limited to a specific range. It's just the whole design portfolio is open for you. Uh, this also comes in different forms of uh, powder as well as solid. Uh, so you're not necessarily limited to just doing it factory applied in a solvent formation. You can do it in water. You can do it in a any approved solvent that's dissolved uh, so if you have an approved solvent that's dissolved for low VOC, you can do that as well. It's, you're not necessarily stuck to one way of working with the material. You can select it in a wide range of options. And, and if you contact a the manufacturer, they'll be able to, to help you if it's a paint manufacturer, or we can help get started on what that might look like. From a substrate perspective, you can pick any substrate that you're, you're looking at. Um, it, from metals to aluminum to steel to copper to zinc, it, we all, it's also been done on glass, vinyl, recycled plastic, concrete, and wood. The resin itself is a, a clear resin, so that opens up what you want to put it on and, and how you want to work with, with that. Um, and just as alluded to earlier, there's, there's four main categories of resins. There aren't many outside of 
that uh, you could get into you can how you define it but essentially you have the solvent base for liquid coatings you have resins for low voc so those are where you take it in a, a powder or like a flake form and you dissolve it into a low voc uh, or whatever formulation you want within that and then you can also do it in waterborne as well as it is ama 2605 approved in powder, fully powder coatings where it it wouldn't use any solvents it's just a, a fully approved 2605 powder coating and then you you would uh, then cross link that to to get the, the coating performance you want out of that um, so that would be more factory applied so it necessarily apply to a coil coating but that that is an option as well um, the typical uh, characteristics is it, that it will be used at, so the way that it, it reacts is it will react to crosslink to create a fluorourethane essentially. Um, so it's it's got that urethane property, uh, but you are crosslinking and to create that fluorourethane. And that's how you get that, uh, that weatherability and that durability resistance from UV. Um, and once again, it does not have to be in a factory. This is all field, this can be done field applied, but people do end up using it in a factory as well, just depending on cost or how the, the production of it, whether it's that metal coil or it's a powder coating finish that you would cure in an oven. So performance characteristics, once again, you can use it to repair. You're gonna get that uh, same performance as uh, you would in, in a powder coating. And then what you're looking at is something that lasts 30 years plus. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the 2605 standard, that's South Florida over 10 years, but there are some environments where you get 30 years plus out of these systems. There's been theoretical advantages of 60 years uh, and even um, estimates of 100 years plus, depending on the environment you are in. Uh, Abu Dhabi or South Florida is going to weather differently than, than New York. So you're, you're really looking at some of those performance characteristics and just stuff that you don't want to have to recoat. You don't want to have to, to fix these things. Once again, you want that color. You want, want this to last for a long time. The applications of FEVs. So you'll establish the, the type of metal substrate. The substrate could be factory coated. It could be cold rolled steel, hot dip, galvanized, electro galvanized, zinc steel, aluminum, stainless steel, copper, or even brass. Um, if you are going to end up doing any touch up or any other stuff, you'll have to identify the previous coating, whether it was coated with PVDF. We get a lot of calls on recoding PVDF. Uh, is it possible? Can you do it in the field? And so you'll you'll have to understand like what happened to the previous coating. Is there any damage? Do you have to do any cleaning of that surface and, and proper treatment? So you'll correct those problem areas, it, whether it's corrosion, uh, galvanic, water drainage, scratch in transportation, or if it was poorly, uh, poorly applied recode or any other touch-ups that weren't necessarily applied. So you'll uh, identify those and then you'll pick the application method that fits best for, for fixing up those areas. So once again, this is the, the field applied and you're really looking at any I mean, I, people have used for, for years any surface, whether it be plastics or composites, steel, aluminum, wood, concrete. People have been applying lumiflon coatings for all different types of applications. Uh, and that's that's where they they just have a wide range of, of what you can work with them on. Oh, jump too far. So I'll pause for questions. And if there are any at this time, so I'll give a few seconds. Pause. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions here. Thanks, Phil. Um, uh, one of the listeners is interested in about the, and you, you got into it a little bit, the commercial capacity in the industry to produce FEVE versus PVDF. Um, I, you know, is FEVE used in electric vehicles? Um, uh, what's the capacity there? So it sounds like it's a two-part question. The first one would be commercial capacity, and the second one would be electric vehicles. So Correct. the use in electric vehicles, no, there are not any uses in electric vehicles if you're referring to the battery itself. Um, that's, that's not something that the chemistry opens up to. If you're asking about automotive coatings, automotive is a absolutely a segment that Lumifon and FEV has been used for an extended long time. 
Uh, there are certain brands of vehicle, if you're buying a Ferrari, you want your, your paint to last. Uh, so there are certain brands and certain segments of vehicles that people do use this in the automotive sector. So hopefully that answers that question in two parts. Commercial capacity, um, PVDF is the dominant material within the market. So FEVE is, is widely used. I mean, it's available in commercial capacity. I don't know how large the project you're referring to, uh, but it, it's been used on the Hudson Yards in New York. So there are iconic and very large buildings that use FEVE and, and metric tons level if, if I don't know how large your projects would be. So yes, it is available in commercial capacity, but the risk of fleeing for another market like electric vehicles is not as high. Um, and whereas it is high if you are looking at the PDF based systems. Thanks. Um, we've got some more, but let's keep more questions. Let's keep going and we can come back and circle back around on them. Okay. So in the second part uh, of presentation, which is the performance characteristics is specifically right now, the performance characteristics of powder coatings. Um, so these are used on OEM coatings of aluminum extrusions is the majority of what powder coatings are used for. Uh, and this is where you're gonna wanna use a full, or you, you, know, you can use a fully powder, so you're not even using any solvents uh, to get a 30 year life uh, top coat that you have superior gloss and color resistance as well as that chalking resistance um, and resistance to chemicals on the surface. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna wipe uh, if, you, if you use a powder coating. And the main benefits are there's no solvents and no VOCs. So what goes on the bucket goes on the wall. If anyone's ever heard the catchphrase, or if you know the lingo within the industry, the transfer efficiency is extremely high, meaning that you're recycling and you're reusing that material. So you're even if it doesn't necessarily get onto the part itself, it's in an area where it can be recaptured and then reused for the next part because uh, it's in a contained area. And how they do that is they will, for a curtain wall, they'll use it uh, in a, a factory coating system uh, where they'll apply it to clean prepared aluminum substrates with electrostatic spray. That'll be a multi-step process to clean degrease, renew contaminants. And then once that's grounded and the metal parts are in the system, they'll just charge up the, the gun and splay the metal part. And then they'll send that through to a curing oven. And then that curing oven uh, will cross link and get that all that the properties you want out of the coating system. Uh, these are factory applied and um, you can use liquid PDF, but once again, you can just move to a powder system if you don't want to have to deal with solvents in your factory or you don't want to have to deal with solvents in your project because you're looking to, to gain, gain that edge. Why would you do that? Well, it's two part when you do have the benefits to not going to the VOCs, but also um, if you just look at the amount of material that's used, this is on a relative basis. If you look at 100% to um, like 100% to 100%, but it doesn't necessarily get to the coating effectiveness, which is that transfer efficiency. So if you have liquid paint and you don't necessarily get it on the surface and it's stuck to the wall of the can or whatever you're using, uh, you can't necessarily always go back and reuse that. Whereas with the powder coating, you can. It's just a contained chamber, and you can just continue to use that. So now we'll get into the, the proof is in the pudding, as I was raised on as a phrase. So this is the performance testing, and this is where we'll start to show from the accelerated weathering testing and some of the real life data that yes, these, these things perform. You may be accustomed to PBDF, so we definitely use that as a benchmark as well. Um, that's, this is where you'll see in an accelerated format where that degradation, where that failure is, and how much failure as well. Uh, there's certainly so many tests out there on a material side from accelerated weathering, but we'll go through a few of these to, to show how they, they are monitored and, and, and what we've seen on ours. Uh, so weathering corrosion testing, it's pretty standard across the industry. It's, it's used to measure that. Um, there's different test methods, uh, and we'll talk through a few. Uh, so th there's pros and cons to both. So if you uh, ask a someone to give me a paint that lasts longer than 30 years, no one's gonna sit around and wait 30 years to figure out if it works or not. So that's why accelerated testings are used to give an indicator of, well, how well is it gonna perform? Uh, and to give an indication of 
let's not sit around and wait 30 years for developing the next best paint formulation. Let's let's figure this out quickly. So that's what the acceleration is used. And then the real time weather is uh, that's where you have to do it because there's nothing. No one can predict the weather, so it's just going to uh, beat up a coating more than anything else that's out there. And South Florida is the harshest environment within shipping distance of major East Coast, uh, where most materials companies are. So that's where a lot of the, the weathering testing is, is done. Um, sure, we could go to Hawaii, but it'd be, it'd be tough to ship stuff there. So we'll, uh, this is the weathering. If you compare an FEVE, a polycyloxane, and acrylic, and you can see after about 3,000 hours, the gloss retention is completely gone on the polycyloxane and the acrylic, whereas the FEVE coating maintains that gloss past 5,000 hours. And this was a, a QUVB exposure, um, and it, it's just the superior gloss retention is the benefit of the material. It's, it's not going to break down under that, that uh, QUVB. Another test that we did was the accelerator weathering ometer in a swamp chamber, and that's similar to cyclic prohesion. It's, it's an older version of the test uh, where it's handling UV as well as in humid, humid environment. Um, and so you can see between the FEVE and the PVDF, they're just maintaining that gloss retention over thousands and thousands of hours of exposure. Which one is is better? It, it's it's very close. I mean, anything between ninety and, and eighty percent, like it's going to be very comparable. And it's just like anything; those formulations are one formulation of many that exist out there. Like you have to match the pigment to the the resins of the paint. And so, as long as they're within a certain range, they're they're on par. I, I'm not saying that the PVDF is worse here. It, it definitely we would consider that to be very comparable. Other tests that we've done is the accelerated weathering and xenon and arc and amaqua testing. And once again, it's a similar comparison. You can just see compared to what you might be accustomed to in the PVDF and the FEVE, it's it's weathering very similar, contain, uh, maintaining that gloss retention over extended long period of time, depending on what test environment you, you throw it through. Then this is the, the benefit of where you can start to see in an accelerated format, is this going to compare to the like what's going to be you're going to see on your buildings over 30 and 60 years as, as you paint it up? Um, so this is where we put it through real time weathering in South Florida. So we had two different formulations, a yellow and a clear, and this is what you have to do to pass the AMA 2605 and between the yellow formulation and a clear formulation, remembering the clear the resin does come in a clear format. Uh, the it, it shows weathering for ten year in my in Miami, Florida, and it's it's great. I mean, you're only losing about twenty five percent of a gloss for ten years in Florida. I mean, if anyone goes to Florida, you know how dull some of the paints are, uh, depending on if it wasn't used with with high performance coatings. And with that, some of these were the panels that we had, and you can see some of the results. Uh, these were done in Okinawa, not in necessarily South Florida, but that is Japan's version of South Florida. And in Japan in the summer, you know how hot it can get. Uh, so just forewarned, if you ever do plan on visiting, uh, you, you'll know how hot it can get there. But we compared the FEVE to the PVDF to a polyester, uh, as well, and this was a high-performance polyester. So the the top was marked off, so it was unexposed, so it was already covered, so it wasn't going to see any UV exposure, and you can really see that that color difference. Hopefully, it comes through right on the webinar. And this the the coating you can see, like theoretically, it would just continue to last and not even change its color. Like I can't tell a difference between the FEVE red and the unexposed red. I can for the the black. Uh, but I mean, the PVDF, you see that that maintained its color as well. And and once again, this is a comparison to some of the 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 lower performing resins and then that high performing resin characteristics. Um, once again, another FEVE for gloss retention versus FEVE versus PVDF in Okinawa, which is Japan South Florida version. Uh, this was done on an offshore platform. Uh, I think it was at Surja Bay Marine Test Station, uh, and these were two samples that were tested, and you could see that the FEVE 
lumiflon resin they only lost a little bit of the coating whereas the acrylic urethane was just completely gone so it's going to survive in, in harsh environments uh, this is a cross-section of a real-time weathering in Tokyo. And so the cross-section itself was, was taped off. Um, so on that, you can see that uh, the film loss was estimated between 22 and 28 microns on a cross-section. So they put it through a fancy microscope. Uh, and you can look at it. It's, it's pretty cool how you can look at those cross-sections. And you can just see that the... The FEV, the thermoset fluoropolymer, only lost like 1.1 microns at its like lowest spot after 15 years, or the other one. You can just see how how low it was getting chipped away just from just from UV and ex, uh, exposure. Another test: um, if you ever seen paint itself, and you go to an old building and you like rub your hand, or if you've ever been to an old bridge and you rub your hand on the handrail and you're wondering why your hand's a little bit discolored, that's that chalking effect. Uh, so we were also look. One of the things you want to look for in coatings is how chalky is it going to get. Um, and so there's a limited chalking effect if you're looking at exposure for some of these materials. Like it's it's going to help protect it from degrading and becoming powdering, where it's not going to stick together and stay stuck to the surface. Uh, more commonly in the future, things have been going in corrosion testing. So EIS has become quite popular in the past few years to, to look at that. And uh, this is some of the testing that we've done on EIS, and that's to measure the amount of electrical reaction within the materials themselves to see how fast is corrosion happening or not. Corrosion is a major problem. I mean, corrosion is where you're gonna, your project's life cycle cost is gonna really get at you from bridges, water towers, other metal structures. So having a top coat as well as that zinc bridge primer that are gonna really help you on corrosion are gonna be really important. And so the top coat is can be proven to be just as important. Uh, and those are some of the tests we, we have here that we'll, we'll walk through. Um, these are some of the, the measures that we measured that impedance, so the amount of electrical activity uh, based on the, the different categories of tests on the, the x-axis there, the accelerated weathering and salt fog. And then you can see some of these panels. Uh, it might not exactly jump out at you, but there is a difference in that scribed distance. So that they're scribed in the center. So you just take uh, a dime pen and you scratch that surface. And then you see how far does the corrosion branch out to the right and left. So you're measuring that x-axis distance. And you can see on the, the uh, the FEVE is going to last better than the polyurethane. So that top coat is going to give you a little bit of protection is what we're trying to prove in these, these tests. Uh, if we jump into architectural standards, which you might be accustomed to, I mean, we, we work through ASTM standards. Uh, there's the AMPP, the AWA, uh, AWWA, and the AMA that we've all tested to. And uh, you probably are most familiar with the AMA and AMA 2605 is where you're gonna be looking at. So if you just go right down to the bottom, AMA 2605, you're probably working with a PVDF or an FEVE system. And these are really the two that meet that category. And that's where something needs a 10 year exposure in South Florida. And you can only lose a certain amount of gloss and it has to not chalk and has to resist that. And very few materials can last that long. Um, you you kind of have to have that carbon flooring bond to withstand uh, that degradation. These are the Yama test standards written out. Um, so you can go through them if you're interested. The slides will be presented. Forgot to mention that out up front, but yeah, you can go through the, the Yama 2605 and, and that's where uh, you're gonna look at where you're at, your building, your designing is at in the uh, on the globe and figure out how much UV exposure you're looking at, where where how many hours that, that paint's gonna last. So I'll pause there for questions and to get a drink of water real quick. <laughs> Yeah, take a drink. Uh, you're doing great. Uh, we've got a bunch of really great questions. I'll ask a couple now, and then we'll do some more at the end. Um, one clarification, you talked about uh, high-performance polyester paints. Is that the same as an SMP paint? Is that the category that we're talking about? Yeah, you can kind of, there's multiple high-performance polyesters, but SMP is a specific one for coil coating resins. And SMP and PVDF do, uh, are options with when you're looking at that coil coating resin um, so yeah i would have to go back and figure out which specific one that is but there are so many forms of high performance polyesters it's hard to say specifically but yes smp is within that category 
and, and another, somebody asked about how recently did the FEV, FEVE gain the AMA 2605 rating? Is that, is that fairly new or has it been around for a while? Oh, I don't know when it was uh, specifically, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know when it specifically reached that. I will have to ask the team, but I know it's been there before I started working, so before a decade ago. Um, right. well, I'll, if people are interested in that and other technical questions, they can follow up with you. Uh, we have your email later on correct. and yep. follow up email. So if we don't get to your question, um, folks can follow up with you directly about that. It's, uh, Absolutely. Happy to, happy to help out. So I will continue going on. So why do you why would anyone care about high performance coatings? Because yes, uh, it has all the performance benefits, but uh, it does come at the uh, prove it uh, from the life cycle cost advantage because these things are inherently expensive. Uh, no one walks into the top ski branding and asks for a jacket that's going to perform best and then not expect to pay more. And that's similar. These these aren't easy materials to make. So within that, we have to look at the life cycle uh, cost advantages of these materials to make sure they make sense from an environmental and from just an economical standpoint. Uh, those are questions we ask ourselves every day. So the in this analysis, it's a simplified analysis. It doesn't have fancy MPV or IRR or anything like that, but we did look at the thicknesses of the top coats, the cost you're gonna be paying to apply that on a area basis. And so we, we took some of those and we took those and said, okay, what's the average lifetime of those, those coatings? And you can average that out to an applied cost per meter squared per year. And that's, that's really the way to be thinking about these is if you're thinking on a, uh, just an individual material perspective, no one would ever buy it. Uh, but if you're thinking about it on what are the other values that this brings, like the less maintenance you have to do, uh, the less retouch up you have to do, I can set it and forget it. The brand awareness, cause it's gonna maintain that gloss and that retention. Those are the, the extra benefits, but even just on a lasting more years per, per, estimated coding life these are the numbers that come out on a simplified calculation and it points in strong favor of really looking at it now this is application specific so you have to dig in more if you have questions um, we're happy to, to look at that with you and, and that's where when you look at it from an initial standpoint the paint is going to be a line item in your cost and it is going to cost more than if you look at a polyurethane and yes it will be a sticker shock but if you're looking at it on a 10-year estimated relative applied cost, which is the bar on the right, you're really going to be saving your money in that you, you forgot that you did it in the first place. And you're going to be so happy because you're not going to have to repaint. Um, and you're not going to have to worry about the owner calling you back um, and wondering why it's, it's different. So that's uh, just the question on whether you want to pay now or you want to pay later. And then you can make that design, design decision based on the conversations with the owner. And these are an option to... Yes, you pay more upfront, but you are going to save more in the life cycle costs, which is the direction that we all want to be going. Uh, even within the bridge market, everyone talks about that we want the 100 year lifetime bridge. This is a way to help get that closer uh, with paint being such a small line item within that bridge cost to be able to get to, to those uh, areas that we want to be as, as a country. So within that, um, just Rehashing some of the benefits, you're going to save repair costs. You're going to be twice as long as mass uh, as other most other coatings. And 30 to 60 years is completely achievable depending on where you're at within the equator. And then the life cycle cost advantage of FEV over polyurethanes ranges from 15 to 30 percent depending on the project um, and, and what math you use. Uh, so with that, we jump into some of the the bridges that we've done. Yeah, this was done in to QL. Uh, and so you can look at some of the initial gloss colors, 2008, 2016. And uh, we were due to go out there and get some more photos on this bridge. Uh, they actually painted half of it with the, um, I think, yeah, it was a polyurethane. And then they end up just painting the whole thing with FEV coatings um, in Japan. So you can see like even on a red pigment, it's still maintaining uh, pretty well in that color over all the years. Uh, and yes, camera technology has gotten better, so it, it doesn't necessarily compare one to one. Uh, in terms of the benefits from an 
uh, environmental standpoint, you are looking at a low VOC coating. So if you think back to the four forms that we talked about at the beginning, you're going to have that low VOC solvent-based coating where you can take powder or solid form of the product and dissolve it into whatever VOC solvent uh, regu uh, regulated that you want to get that can reach below 150 grams or it can be exempt depending on what, which solvent that is. You can do it completely in a powder coating and just get it completely away from VOCs themselves and just be a fully powdered system or you can do it in water-based. There are water-based systems uh, that, that work and are used uh, in the field already. Uh, a lot of bridges in California are starting to use more water-based systems with this because they want to get that long life, uh, but they also want to get away from VOCs and, and be in the water form. Uh, and considerations that you're going through when you're looking at the environmental aspect is the coating production, the transportation, the waste production, the traffic, the VOCs. Um, so even when you are uh, coating another project, you, you consider all the transportation costs, the procurement costs, the time, the energy it takes. So you're, you're going to be saving those as well as necessarily what the uh, savings is in the material to con material comparison itself. So it's not just the material, it's all the other things that go around it. And once again, paying for a can of paint, and albeit how expensive, it's still less expensive than some of the prices that it takes to just even start a project. Uh, and that probably will continue to be the case as things move forward. Uh, powder is, is absolutely an option. Um, no VSCs, no chrome, single coat. You can reclaim and reuse. And that that's to that transfer efficiency, which are just extremely high, uh, where you can just reclaim that because it's in a contained system. No hazardous waste. Uh, you can get accreditation with some of the lead credit credits, depending on uh, how you work within your project and, and, and where you're at. That the, the specific manufacturer can help you out with that one. Um, so that's that's where you can apply for some of the building life cycle impact reductions, the heat island reductions, uh, if you can fit that in, and as well as the uh, minimum energy performances that buildings need. Just to go over some of those benefits again, that that can be achieved. Um, you can help maintain that solar reflectancy of the roof, reducing that heat island tested in Japan. That FPV resins reduces dirt accumulation on roofs as well. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, we're maintaining that effectiveness and that reflectiveness of the roof itself. Uh, so they've been formulated in white for cool roofs. Uh, solar, they're used in solar panels, like where they just see, they're meant to see the sun uh, to be able to transfer to electricity. So just that durability and that superior like performance is just gonna help you out. So you can match the resin and the pigment to kind of tailor the properties to what you need. And so now it's the favorite part is all the pretty pictures. So we can, can all uh, go back to the days of picture books and just look through some of the projects, uh, various different coil coatings and power coatings that you'll see. Uh, some of these might be iconic where you recognize them, some might not. This one's pretty recognizable. Jomo Dimaggio's Hospital, uh, you have downtown Chicago, Washington, DC, uh, anyone, another downtown Chicago. Uh, uh, this one's pretty iconic. You can't miss it if you're uh, in the park there downtown. In Columbus, uh, you also have Schuylkill Yards. Uh, it's not pictured here, but that's another one that's that was done just recently, if anyone's been to downtown Philadelphia. So with that, I will open up for questions. Yeah, Phil, we got a bunch of uh, good questions here. Um, uh, I'm gonna start at the top. Um, uh, in the factory applications, are FEVE coating baked similar to the PVDF coatings? Um, it, yeah, so in factory coatings, they are gonna be uh, baked. I mean, it's just easier to do on a, a factory settings. I don't know how the equipment runs. That's where you would have to contact the, the major manufacturers. If you need a referral to one of those, I mean, we're happy to put you in contact for a specific formulation, or we do help with starting formulations as well. Uh, we only have a technical center here to help on that. Um, but yes, those would be those would be 2K baked. And I'm going to blend two questions into one here. I've got a question about how uh, AGC offers warranties and the uh, uh, kind of a follow-up to that is is the warranty affected 
if it's used in a coastal application less than 1500 feet from salt water you talked a little bit about corrosion so yeah so the warranty itself will be the paint manufacturer and yes corrosion and where you are located is is how one of their criteria i mean everyone's going to be pretty similar at least uh, from what i've seen from all the the manufacturers that use our resin uh, within their formulation they're going to have a comfort level of what they know whether they have a geographic specific so yes the where you are in terms of closeness to the equator as well as where you are in closeness to a corrosive environment are going to be kind of the two major players of how long they believe it's going to last and offer that warranty to um and can you use the liquid version of the FEVE to uh, field touch up powder, a powder coated surface? Yes. So uh, we get calls on touch up for PVDF and also for uh, powder coating as well. But that one I'm actually not 100% sure on. So that one I will need to check with my technical team because um, the powder coating should have better, like, uh, better resistance to. To getting damaged if it's going to be transport but let me check that one with the team and it depends on what type of uh, uh damage you have to that surface too uh and uh, another person asking here about uh metallic paints can you can you make metallic paints and and also do you have an idea how long custom colors take to get um i don't know uh custom colors i don't know how long People are saying, so we, we have a certain volume that we supply to the major manufacturers. Uh, I know metal kind of that, that color was in style for a long period of time. So there's been a lot of work on like that, that metal tint. Uh, but yes, you, you can kind of make something look like it's copper, even though it's not a copper finish uh, with, with FEVE resins themselves. So that, that's, that's actually a really cool effect. If you uh, ever go to one of the major shows, I think AIA is coming up. And if you go to that and stop by, they will have all the different colors of panels and metallic's gonna be an option that they can choose on that. Um, how long custom colors are out from each vendor? I uh, I don't know, that's where you'd have to work with, uh, did you want it coated or do you just want the paint itself? Um, did, or did you want the actual coated panel and the project delivered to a site? That that one we, we don't work with, we just work to get the resin to the manufacturer itself. But if you do want to start working on a formulation, happy to sample if you're working on it directly. So if, if you're actually making that, happy to get you started with starting formulations. We have, like, once again, we have a technical center here. We're fully staffed. Uh, we have some pretty smart senior chemists on staff that those are the types of projects they love to help out on. Uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, and actually another question about the baking, uh, the factory applied version is uh, what the bake temperature is, and is there a primer required? What's, uh, uh, let me ask this question the way it's sent, sent in here rather than me fumble around on it. For factory applying, what is the bake temperature? Is there a primer required? And what is the expected coverage for spray applied on a flat sheet? That's like three separate questions. Yeah, uh, so let me see if I understand. So factory applied, they're wondering bake temperature. That one, I will probably have to defer to my technical team. Um, and also we're not the ones running the equipment so i don't know what people feel comfortable running on their side so that one kind of two-part the second one was can you do single coat is is that the it, there is a primer required yes or can you do single coat yeah uh people have been doing direct to metal out there with fpv coatings it does exist it depends on your comfort level if you want to do it um, and what you want to uh, put on your building it, it does exist but I mean that you are going to get the best performance on on multi coat, but single coat is out there. Uh, it, it's an option. And then and the last question. Yeah, the Go third ahead. was coverage on a, a, a applied on a flat sheet. How much? Can coverage? you say that one again? Uh, what's the expected coverage for spray applied on a flat sheet? Coverage for spray? I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, we. I think that would have to come from the paint manufacturer. Yeah, they, I mean, we have estimates, but it would not be appropriate for me to to answer that one. Um, that one would be specific to to the formulation made and the performance you're looking for, because like you're playing around with the the film thickness um, and just that transfer, like what's going back to that transfer efficiency too. So that's that's going to be paint specific and 
uh, product specific too. Uh, okay. The other point which uh, I wanted to touch on on that bake temperature. So one of the things that you can do is you can use blocked curing agents. So you can actually tailor the curing to a specific temperature, whether you want it to be higher or you just want it to, to cure at room temperature. So that, I think I forgot to mention in the webinar, but yeah, that, that's um, one of the reasons what's great about some of the bridge coatings is it will cure at room temperature as well. So you don't need to heat it uh, with that curing agent to get the effect you want within the coating to make it last for a long time. So hopefully that also answers their factory applied question. But once again, that's specific to what color you're asking for, what uh, resin, curing, all that. Uh, one one final question, and this is over towards the sustainability side of things. Um, are there FEVE systems that meet the living building challenge requirements? Are, are, are they red list free uh, or on the yeah red list free? Are they red list free? Red list. Uh, are there are there FEV coatings that make the red list? That means they don't have any. Uh, the red list rules out anything with um, uh, lack of sustainability or harmful to the environment products that are that. And are there okay. any FEV coatings that make the living building challenges red list? Yeah, I'm not. Uh extremely well read up on the living building challenges. Uh, I'm certainly not an architect, so I don't know that one. Um, if they're referring to a specific red list right now, there are a lot of NGOs out there and each one has specific messaging that they are choosing to go with. So I, I don't know what exact list they'd be referring to. These are not, uh, so FEV is not on the EPA band list. It's uh, and that's published on, on their website. Uh, and there is right now, yes, it is a floral polymer. So yes, we are just like everyone else, part of different organizations to take a look at these and understand what we need to fit within the EPA guidelines to say, these are the tests that you have to prove as things are going forward. But right now from an OECD standpoint, these are polymers of low concern. And the criteria within that is that they are high molecular weight, they do not dissolve in water, and they don't bioaccumulate. So those are kind of the, the criteria looking at what are the chemicals we need to look at from a environmental standpoint. And it, it's a high molecular weight, it does not dissolve in water, and it doesn't bioaccumulate. So that's, that's some of the criteria that's being looked at by some of the leading organizations out there. One of the, and I think the, the red list that's done by uh, Living Building Challenge, last I looked, and, and everybody should double check me on this, there is uh, our coatings that do meet that those requirements. I don't know whether they're FEVE coatings or not. So uh, you can look that up on the Living Building Challenge's website. Um, but um, any final words? Bill, great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so everybody, if you want some more information, you can go to lumaflonusa.com. You're going to get an email with uh, Phil's uh, email follow-up. So you can, if you have more specific technical questions, you can follow up directly with him. Uh, again, the CEUs on certificates are going to be handled automatically. So you don't need to do anything. Just allow us seven business days for the processing of that. Um, uh, and thanks for attending. We're doing another webinar at the end of the month on uh, May 25th, I think it is, Single Skin Metal Panels and Lead Standards and Certifications. It's presented by AEP SPAN. Uh, you can check out all of our webinars at metalarchitecture.com slash webinars. And um, Phil, fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.